cold again. And it looks by the looks of the truck, it dumped about five more inches of snow last night. Apparently the highway's white out. We got to take kids to the ferry to get them back home. Nice. And uh, there, quick note, there is a shit pile of good people here in the world, especially uh, this group of people right here. I'm, I think I'm looking out through the, through the lens. What a bunch of kind souls. And a lot of people have come forward and helped my, my friend, my lifelong friend, Michelle with her cancer and her two children. I don't even know what to say. What do you say? I'm stuck for words. So, so, so appreciated. And you know how it works out in life. You reap what you sow in life. All you kind souls out there, I'm quite certain there's going to be nothing but kindness bestowed on you in return without a doubt. It's funny, I forgot to mention yesterday it was well about Michelle. So here she is raising two kids on her own. Not a career woman. And uh, then she decides she needs to go out and become a certified firefighter so she can help people. I forgot to mention that yesterday. She went out and became a certified firefighter to boot. She is very, very appreciative. I spoke with her quite a bit last night. And um, thank you so, so much, for all you people that reached out with a prayer or a donation to help her and her, and her children out during this shitty time. But I also, uh, related to the topic that we normally talk about these days on this channel, I'd like to add in about Michelle. And you can Google up where she was living for quite some time was near Heather Jean. I think it's called Heather Jean is the general neighborhood is what they called it. I think that is halfway, well, not quite halfway, but maybe a third, almost halfway down Lillooet Lake. All right, southeast of Pemberton. And that is where there is so many sightings. It's absolutely ridiculous. And there's no, there was no electricity down there. There's a lot of real cool rural cabin style homes down there. There's logging road down there. There's a few remote native communities way farther down. And that drain also goes towards Harrison, British Columbia. And you've all heard of Harrison. Harrison, British Columbia, uh, when it comes to this topic of these being drained around the forest. And uh, the amount of sightings of people I know who have seen these things all around that Heather Jean, a little farther down on the left, is called Twin One. There's been a pile of settings up around in Twin One, all the way down the main logging road on either side of Little Lake, all over the place. And I remember Michelle telling me, because it would be summertime and so hot out down there in the summertime, their windows would be open, and she said she could hear them. You see, if you, if you Google up Little Bit Lake, you'll see how steep those mountains are. And their bedroom window would face the mountainside, so you basically it's like straight up there to that never before logged timber patches. And I remember her telling me she could hear them. Um, verbalizing, making some kind of speech or sounds way up the mountain in the middle of the night, two, three o'clock in the morning. And she also knew a woman who also was asking everybody around the neighborhood if bears walk on their, walk on their hind legs to cross the road. <laughs> and she was serious. I guess she'd seen something real big and black walking across the road just a little farther down from Michelle's house. And Michelle also introduced me. She's one of the first people I met, her and her partner at the time, one of the first people I met when I moved to that area years ago. And um, she also introduced me. She knew of a lot of people who had seen these beings and steered me towards them. That was back when I was, when I was foolishly trying to look for these beings intentionally. I call it foolishly not for anybody, just for me. It wasn't the right, I found out for me, it wasn't the right thing to do. When somebody wants to be left alone and they outclass the shit out of you, they're going to let you know it. Right? But anyway, there you go. Um, if anybody's not quite sure what I'm talking about, it comes to my friend Michelle. Uh, yesterday I sent out just, a, just enough, you know, she's, she has cancer. She's going in for all the treatments. And um, I just don't know what to do. You know, what do you do? I don't know what to do. Pray your face off. Um, scrape up as much money as you can to uh, send her away so that the kids are going to be all right while well, she's in the hospital going through all this shit. And a lot of you, a lot of people came out. I, I put the GoFundMe link up in the video description below and a whole pile of people went out of their way to help Michelle out. Kind, kind souls. I'm speechless. I don't know what to say. So I just thank you so much. So there you go. For all you people who are watching this video who haven't seen yesterday's video, that's what I'm talking about.
I'll put that link in down below in case anybody wants to throw a couple cents her way. A couple dollars, anything will help. And you know it comes full circle all the way back when you're kind. We all know that. Anyway, I had a scare this morning. Somebody's been trying to break into my emails. Somebody's been trying to hack into my email accounts. There's no shortage of coward, cowardly sacks of shit out there who, uh, who would love to go out of the way to try to disrupt life for me. I know who a few of them are. Unfortunately, they're on the other side of the border. Otherwise, the way I feel about them, I would come down there and find you personally. We'll have a real serious chat. We just might one day. You know who you are. Cowards. Coward ass pussies. There's nothing worse for me than a pussy. And a lot of people say, you know, the pussy's a dirty word. Well, you know, in, in man's world, when you call somebody a pussy, it's because they're like a little kitten. They're like a little helpless kitten, just a little fragile pussy who hides and lashes out and tries to attack people from the safety of a keyboard or wherever or, or, or under a false name. That's a pussy. Sorry. I'll bite my lip. <laughs> Just, uh, that was a real troubling moment this morning. I thought that my emails had all been wiped out and all of your emails had all been absolutely wiped out and gone forever. Uh, thankfully got it all recovered. Anyway, moving along. Let's get some voices heard and then I'm gonna carry on with this day, this beautiful day in the world today. Get a hold of my friend Michelle, see where she is. And uh, see how she's doing. And uh, see if I can meet up with her at the hospital. Now, listen to this one. Nahat Latch Possible Encounter. Hello, Steve. Found a YouTube channel while trying to figure out what I had heard late one night camping at Squawkum Campground on Nahat Latch Lake, BC, last Labor Day long weekend. It was our last night and the fire ban had just been lifted. A group of four stayed at the fire till about midnight, 1 a.m. ish. I stayed and watched the fire. I stayed and watched the fire embers burn down for a bit before dousing the fire and hitting the sack. I couldn't quite fall asleep. Too much coffee, I'm thinking. It was about 3.30 in the morning when I heard this huge bellowing roar. This sounded like it came from just outside my tent. Oof. I heard no footsteps or activity. The roar was repeated. The sound was unlike any animal or bird I've ever heard before. I don't know how, but my wife slept through it, as did my brother-in-law in a neighboring tent. His wife was asleep in the car near our tent to get some peace and quiet from her husband snoring. She heard it too. I found out over coffee the next morning. We discussed what we heard, decided it was some kind of a big ass owl or something, and we kind of glossed over it. Since then, I've been trying to Google different animal sounds without success when I stumbled on your channel. There are some recordings online of Sasquatch vocalizations that come close to what I heard, but I'm still unsure. Just wanted to share this to see if anyone's had similar experiences in the area. The campground was pretty quiet for a long weekend because it was the first weekend it was open after the fire closure of that area and rain was forecasted. Keep doing what you do. I subscribed and will share your channel with my sister-in-law who's also trying to figure this out, figure out what we heard that night. It's hard to talk about amongst our peers, isn't it? Regards, George Lee. George, yeah, it is or it isn't. You know what, it's all a choice. Um, like I, you probably, I don't know how long you've been listening to everybody on my channel, but if you have in the past, you've heard me say that if you actually are going out of your way, come across this channel and then go out of your way to get the email and send me an email, you already know what it was. You just got to accept it. That's how I feel about that. When people write in and say, I'm trying to figure out what made the sound, I came across your channel. That's because your guided, your gut instinct told you what was going on and possibly that this is one of the best places there is to find out honest information. I think it is the best place actually, myself. But anyway, um, just beware. You'll probably know too after you hear a bunch of people speak that um, once you, they have let you know they are around, you're probably gonna be in for another experience one day as well. Sometimes it can be years apart, but once they let you know, it seems to be that's when the gig's up, right? They'll let you know again. Right, moms? Yeah. All right, what do we got here? Thanks for sending that in, man. Thanks for emailing. Be safe out there. 
Bigfoot Tracks, Olympic National Forest in Washington State. This is the title. Hi, Steve. Officer John Graham here. I really appreciate what you're doing. Keep it going. My personal background is 36 years of law enforcement and decades of hunting and fishing. Feel free to share this story. In the fall of the mid-70s in Mason County, Washington, located in the foothills of the Olympic National Forest, it was hunting season, and my family and I were at a hunting camp with some dear friends of ours. This particular day, I went grouse hunting. I was 12 to 13 years old at this time. I was hiking on a foot trail and went off trail onto an old logging road. After walking on the makeshift road for a while, I came across some huge tracks. The tracks were pressed into the mud and of very good quality. From memory, they were 14 to 16 inches long and pressed into the mud approximately one half inch deep. The track's shape was like a wide human footprint with distinctive toes and went for 100 yards or so on the mud road. The stride of the tracks were way longer than my boot prints I was making. The creature that made the tracks went off the road and made its own path through some thick maple tree saplings. Several trees were pushed over and some were twisted and broken. These trees were two to three inch in diameter. Well, I had seen enough here. All I kept thinking was, this had to be a Bigfoot. I went back to camp and told my mom and dad. I took my mom back to the trail and the location of the tracks. She saw the tracks and the forest trail through the small trees. Something big forced its way through those small trees. My mom was a little concerned and we got the heck out of there. I sure wish I had the opportunity to plaster cast those tracks. Well, we never went back to that area to hunt again. Another Bigfoot story is from a police dispatcher friend of mine. Her story is quite a tale. I'll have to get her permission to share it. I currently live in the Spokane, Washington area. I hunt and scout in the northeast section of Colville National Forest. Every time I'm in the woods, I'm alert and hopeful I will see the elusive Sasquatch. I'm a believer and read and watch lots of posted stories of the internet. Steve, thanks for your time and be safe. Yeah, and you be safe too, John, considering what you do for work. And uh, thanks for, thanks for uh, being straight up honest and sharing that, boldly sharing your experience. It's appreciated. Uh, I'll guarantee you somebody around the same area is going to have something to say, and I'm looking forward to that other story, if you would share it. Maybe you should share this uh, video with with her, or the dispatch person, and uh, and I'm sure that'll knee-jerk, I'm going to knee-jerk, give the knee-jerk reaction to, to get that experience shared in and the knowledge that might come with it that'll help other people here, right? Thanks for sending that in, man. I really appreciate that. All right, well, this seems a little lengthy. Uh, all right, I gotta get going, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to tackle this one and see if I get yelled at from the house. Take it too long. Why me and why now is the title of this email. Hi, Steve, we love the work you do. Your channel has helped us a lot with our experiences. I've attached my experience below in a Word document. Even though this happened back in August, I was struggling to put these things into words until now. The wife and I are avid outdoors people and we live in a remote area, southwest Wyoming slash northern Utah. Even though we've had several small unexplainable things happen over the last couple of years, it wasn't until our experience back in August that it was made perfectly clear that these beings exist. Hope this may help others cope. I try to word my feelings and thought process after it happened. Hope all is well and thanks for all you do. Jeff. Gossar, G-O-S-A-R. Here's the, here's the email. Hi Steve, my name is Jeff Gossar. My wife and I absolutely love your videos and have learned so much because of them. We had an experience that happened a couple months back and would like to share in case it helps anyone else who is struggling to cope with the reality of these beings. Feel free to use my name. A little background on us, my wife and I are both extremely outdoorsy people. I'm from a remote area in the north slope of the Ute, or the north slope of the Uintas, Uintas of Northern Utah. I must drive everybody nuts with my shitty pronunciations of these, some of these names, right? This is what it is. The highest mountain range in Utah. I basically live on the mountain hunting, fishing, logging, hiking, and ranching, and running cows. My childhood was filled with hunting and hiking by myself, often in the dark and snow. I spent five years as a wildland firefighter at a high, at a high level with the Forest Service and BLM. Department of the Interior, not to be confused with those flag-hating kneelers. I absolutely love 
wildland fire the community, the science and the history, and have the fondest memories. It took me some amazing, took me to some amazing remote areas and tested my mental slash physical fitness to the extreme. I'm still involved to a lesser degree. We hike and trail run a ton on the cache National Forest and hunt every archery rifle black powder season back home in the Wintas. I've never had anything weird happen that I can recall except a few tree knocks and rocks thrown in high elevation lakes. I do not know, I did not know that these were what these were at the time and basically just ignored them but felt uneasy a time or two. We were very outdoorsy. The subject of Bigfoot has always been interesting to us. We have open minds and accepted that universe is a massive that the universe is massive, and to think that man or science is all the answers is preposterous, no doubt. Now to the incident. We've been hiking in the Jardine Juniper Trail a lot this year, as well as other trails in northern Utah to get ready for hunting season. The Jardine Trail is one of our favorites, and we spent a lot of time there this year, as it is a good long trail that has little traffic. I had logged about 23 hikes slash runs this, there this year, sometimes alone, sometimes with my wife and others. In August of this year, 2021, we started hiking in the evenings because it was so hot in the daytime. We had done a couple evening hikes the first part of August with no problems whatsoever. Usually we would make it back to the truck by dark. On the night that it happened, which I believe was August 10th, I lost track of time and we got a little bit of a late start. We were above the main switchbacks, which is about three miles in, when it's dark on us, so we decided to turn around. We were both working full time and we were hiking this area about three times a week at this point, so we did not always do the full route each time, usually just a five to seven mile power hike around trip. We were quite sure we, had, we were the last ones up there. We had been passed by a couple of bikers on the way up. We were moving fast and quiet as we were making our way down the switchbacks, just enjoying the late summer stillness in the large timber. The slope is steep, but the trail winds through the large trees nicely and gives you glimpses of the basin below and high peaks above. It was twilight, maybe 15 minutes or so until we needed headlamps to see. We came around the slight turn in the trail right before the large hairpin turn at the bottom of the slope and almost as if caught by surprise, I saw this massive jet black figure go from standing to crouching through a small gap in the timber about 50 yards ahead and just down slope of the trail. Looking back, I'm surprised that I did not freeze or turn my back to my wife to confirm what I saw. All that crossed my mind was, that's weird. Without pause, we kept moving briskly. It was too dark to see detail, but light enough to see our surroundings quite well. Sometimes you think your mind plays tricks on you in the twilight hours, especially in timber with so many shadows. It seemed like just seconds after seeing the creature, I heard a loud crack against a prominent large tree directly upslope from us on our left. There may have been two cracks, I really cannot remember. I turned around thinking that my wife was messing with me and throwing rocks. As I turned, my eyes caught hers. I could tell she was not throwing anything as we were both tired and dazed from our hike. My mind started racing a million miles an hour trying to figure out what animal could do that. The answer is obvious, none. Both of us were frozen there trying to figure out what was going on. Another rock flew directly over us. And this time I saw it smack the same tree with unbelievable force. You could feel the air from it as it zipped by. It reminded me of my baseball days, hearing the seams of a fastball whizzing through the air. I think I quietly mumbled, someone's messing with us. The mind does funny things when full of adrenaline. I could tell that we were hit with the realization that at the same time, without saying a word, just by looking at her facial expression, which was, oh, we are not alone and it isn't human. I did not feel in danger, but needless to say, the feeling was get going, which we obliged. I ripped my handgun out of my pack as we moved, but it was as if my arm was paralyzed at my side with the gun pointing down at the ground. I felt helpless, even with a 10 millimeter in my hand. Steve, it was strange. I am the firearms department head for one of the largest gun dealers in Utah. I feel more comfortable with my gun in my hand than most. I probably have more trigger time than your average LEO. The thought in my mind was, what good is that going to do? Whether it was annoyed or amused, I really cannot say. I just wanted to put as much space between us and it as quickly as possible. The only way I can describe it 
is like when someone sees a ghost, the interaction is real but is not normal. You struggle to grasp what happened. It is hard to comprehend things every time your universe expands. We moved almost to the point of running until we popped out of the timber and it opened up a bit. Still feeling, feeling uneasy as we had a long way to go in the dark, we briefly had to stop to put our headlamps on, not saying a word other than, that's weird. The whole way out, my mind kept trying to reason with what had happened, but I could not. It was so deliberate. We made it back in record time. I did not put two and two together until we were back at the trailhead. What I saw seconds before it happened was the being that threw the rocks. My wife said she also saw it. It stood out like a sore thumb. Even though it was getting dark when I saw it, its blackness was almost radiating against the dark shadows of the forest. So many emotions were going through me. Confusion, anger, intrigue, curiosity. I kept thinking, why us and why now? After all this time in the outdoors, I wanted to try to write it off as me going crazy. My mind was playing tricks on me. If that had happened to me while I was alone, I might have written it off, but I was not alone. And what we both experienced was very real. I was so disturbed by that incident at first, but I could not let this thing control me. I had a couple of guys I worked with go back up there with me two nights later. We stopped at the same gap in the timber so I could better gauge its size by seeing the pocket where it stood in better lighting. It had to be, have been massive. The interesting thing is, when we were right next to this thing during its baseball practice, the foliage was too thick to see anything. It had to have been less than 10 yards away. It was also in between two trails as it was large, it was a large switchback. One moment we were directly above it, the next we were directly below it. Eerie does not begin to describe how we felt. To be so close and not see a thing is unreal. I also have the guys, had the guys throw this sized rocks as hard as they could point blank range at the tree in the same area to compare sounds. My blood ran cold as I heard their rocks make little ping sounds compared to the loud cracks from two nights previous. The realization was creeping in that these things are real and what we had encountered was in fact a Sasquatch. In the following weeks I intentionally went back with others at night to prove to myself and this creature that I was not going to let it control me. I went down so many rabbit holes trying to understand what these things are. I have read and listened to so many other people's accounts, which has helped me a lot. My wife and I love the outdoors too much to be let down this, let this dictate how we live. For all I know, they have always been all around me. It's just that now I'm hyper aware. It's almost as if a veil was getting thinner and thinner until it lifted enough that we were able to see. Now it seems as if they are everywhere. And it is hard not to have them cross my mind. Hiking in the dark will never be the same, that is for sure. Hell, I've even been, hell, I have even been spooked during the day. The hunting, scene that ensued, the hunting season that ensued after this experience was a little tough for me. Even at home or in town when darkness set in every night, I felt the same dark, helpless feeling though. I was miles away from our encounter. Those feelings went away when the sun would rise. I went through different ways of coping. Not being able to understand was and still is hard. I had to just accept the fact that we're both on this planet and I, nothing I can do will change that. I am in control, but I believe the Lord is. I'm not in control, but I believe the Lord is. These things are here for a reason. I just hope it's a good one. And hopefully it will make all sense to us on the other side. The thing I struggle with the most is why, after all this time of being in the outdoors, even being in some of the most remote areas on this continent fighting fires, I've never dealt with these beings until now. Maybe I'll learn the answer to that someday. Also, it is simply crazy to me that all my time with the Forest Service and BLM, nothing was ever really spoken about these things. Mind you, I worked with some extremely savvy people, hot shots, jumpers, hell attack, and everyone in between. Some of these guys were straight up superheroes in my book with lifetimes of experience. Fear and weakness are not in their vocabulary. I would fight fire to hell and back with them. Their experience and knowledge of backcountry wilderness is astounding. Maybe many of them had experiences and just never shared their stories out of fear of, or retribution. Sadly, I'm finding that to be the case all too often. I need to reach out to some of these high-level officials that I worked under and, and respect to see what they know. Maybe if they know that I know, they will be more willing to share. At least that is what I hope. 
I'm certainly not afraid to share as I'm finding it is helping me cope better that way. Anyways, I know this, I know that this incident is tame compared to others and I'm okay with that. <laughs> I would take a rock throwing to screaming or growling any day. I hope that is, that this information is helpful. I couldn't care less what other people think. I know what lurks in the dark and have been next to torching timbers so hot and deafening that the gates of hell would have seemed soothing. I have nothing to prove and fear no man. There are much worse things to fear. Any keyboard warrior who thinks my experience or yours or anyone else's is false and tries to ridicule is so soft, is a soft-handed coward who is too afraid to accept their own lacking and worthlessness in, the, worthlessness in this life. I guarantee that I've spent more time alone in the remote outdoors before the age of 21 than most of these experts' lifetimes. The same can be said for you, Steve. You're one savvy, straight shooting, legit experienced outdoorsman. We would love to go hunting with you someday. I feel that we are kindred spirits. We love the work you do and hope that our experience in some small way helps others. They are real. I do not care who knows it or who does it. I only know what I know. People should not be afraid to come forward. Truth is more powerful than fear. Thanks again, Jeff Gosser. Jeff, I hope to God I pronounced your last name correctly. If I didn't, please forgive me. And thank you so much for that share. And I can't, I don't know, I, have, I can't explain it, Jeff. Why now, why not before? It is bizarre to me. And I know people who are just like you and I with, with outdoor experience who've done just as much time and they don't have two seconds for the topic, don't know anything, never saw anything, never heard anything. It is truly very, it's just a massive curiosity as to the whys for sure, right? And when you decide you are going to approach your, the people who you worked under, people you worked with, what I found when I bring up the topic is when you just, obviously you, I guarantee you, you square up with people when you talk to them no matter what anyway, as a rule. Out of, it's just your natural, your nature for sure, um, is square, I square up with people, look them straight in the eye, and I don't say, hey man, you ever seen a Bigfoot? You can't get more cheese balls than that, thanks to the douchebags on TV who did an extremely well job of making this topic a joke. But what I do is I look people square in the eye and I just say flat out, hey, have you ever uh, seen anything in the woods or heard anything that was kind of weird or alarming in your lifetime? Because I have. And that usually brings people, it, it, it usually enables them to come forward and speak freely, very easily. And a lot of people have emailed me back and said they've tried that approach and they can't believe how many people have shared with them what they've seen, what they heard, right? And then, of course, the people who you worked under, um, I have found the majority of the people who possibly are the business owners or up in the management, they've already had a talking to to keep their mouth shut. And no matter what, you tell people it was a bear. For whatever, for whatever reasons those are. I'm sure a lot of us know. But anyway, keep in touch, all right? Email again, and uh, who knows? Maybe we'll be able to go hunt someday. I can guarantee you all that I will be south of the border soon. Guaranteed. And no, I'm not taking that damn needle once I get down there. Anyway, another topic, another day. Um, all right. I gotta get going. I got a lot on my mind. I got a lot to do. I'm shy on time. I'm gonna be late. Sarah's getting ready to kick me in the ass. And uh, make sure this, those shares keep coming in, all right? Make sure they keep coming in. And one more, uh, sorry, I wanna comment on the rock throwing. You imagine the power in that thing? You imagine, you imagine if one of those things wanted your ass, it could basically almost cut you in half of the rock like we could a high power rifle on a gopher, right? Don't you think? You heard that rock whiz by your head, hit that tree. You imagine if that thing wanted to do it with intent to kill you? The deadly accuracy, but the power behind the rock would be ridiculous. Even though, why would they even need a rock? They just walk up and grab you and twist your head, right? It's a bizarre topic, man. The questions, there's so many questions. Anyway, I gotta go. I could battle forever right now. I've had my two coffees and I haven't ate breakfast yet. So I should shut this down right now and uh, I'll be back and more people are gonna be heard shortly. Thank you so much again for Michelle.
this. Thank you so, so much for helping her out, sending a prayer, sending a couple bucks, whatever you got. It's so much appreciated. All right, I got to go. I'll talk to you guys later on.